Today on Twin Cam, the fifth and final part of our Gander Around the NEC Classic Motor Show. If you got this far and somehow haven't yet seen part four, then I'm a little surprised. But I'll shove a link up in the corner if you're interested nonetheless. And let us start today's video with a bit of an oddity. Through this series, we've seen a number of BMWs ranging from the 60s to the noughties, but we haven't seen anything from the era before. So let's correct that with an amazing little BMW 700. This was the era where that badge really didn't mean a great deal, and the company was doing very little to enamour itself to the buying public. In fact, it was very near collapse, the board even considering a sale to Mercedes-Benz. But the 700 was the firm's saviour, selling in great numbers in the early 60s and allowing the investment that eventually led to the ultimate driving machine mantra being implemented. But the 700 was simple. It was a tiny car with a little 700cc flat twin at the back, with leading and trailing arm suspension and next to zero driving focus. It's a very strange genesis for the modern company that gave us the M cars. At this stage in history, small premium cars were better found elsewhere at companies like Triumph, who for a number of years were absolutely the British answer to what we'd eventually know as BMW. And in 1965, they did something very modern, but also very unusual by creating the Triumph 1300, a small front-wheel drive family car that was leagues ahead of the mainstream competition of Anglias and BMC 1100s. Curiously, the Triumph goes about its front drive while retaining a longitudinal engine layout, like Renault and Audi for example, and using a 1300cc variant of the existing overhead valve four-cylinder. Though the whole 1300 concept would only last five or so years, the body shell lived on, with conversion to rear-wheel drive, the fitment of an overhead cam engine, and a serious facelift to become the Triumph Dolomite. Triumph were one component of British Leyland's specialist division, merging with Rover, but one mark always held its own at the top, and Rover Triumph always had to be careful not to interfere with Jaguar. Launched in 1968, the year BL was formed, the Jaguar XJ was simply one of the best cars in the world, and its basic design was so good that it was produced for 24 years. But this car is a Series 1, dating from 1969, powered by the iconic and racing bred 4.2 litre XK straight 6. And not only was the XJ a brilliant luxury car, but with that engine, independent rear suspension and inboard brakes, it was just a great car to drive as well, taking all that heritage and pedigree and installing it in a car for the ages. And we haven't even mentioned the supremely elegant styling. The XJ may have been the culmination of everything great about the old pre-BL Jaguar, but what came before was at the centre of Jaguar's racing era, a 3.4 litre saloon, the car we know retrospectively as the Mark I. The Mark I and its revised replacement ran from 1955 to 1968 and are beautifully curvaceous. But despite being very traditionally British in their style, they aren't upright or stodgy in the slightest. The Mark II may have opened up that style somewhat and taken the crown as probably the best remembered, but this Mark I is in the perfect spec, with the dark green and black wires giving it a slight race car vibe. Also utterly correct in green, though not so much with a race car vibe, is Jaguar's modern stablemate, the Land Rover. This one's a Series 3 that's been totally restored, and on its own, a restored Land Rover is a very nice thing, though generally unnoteworthy. They're brilliant, but they're everywhere. So this one has caught my eye for very good reason. Because with their aluminium bodywork and body-on-frame construction, Land Rovers, even or especially from factory, are slightly creased, and all the parts don't quite fit together properly. They're rugged farm vehicles with zero attention paid to the finish. But this car's totally straight, 
with no dodgy panel gaps or rippled panels. It's mint. And the paintwork matches that perfectly because it sheens in a manner that Solihull could never have dreamed of. An absolute credit to the restorers. But through the years, Land Rover ceased to be farm vehicles, mainly thanks to the growth of the Range Rover. The brilliant Spen King designed actual normal car, come 4x4, was still pretty spartan when it was launched in 1970. But through the years, it was so good that the idea of replacement wasn't even floated. And as the Range Rover became a status symbol, the luxuries were gradually added. It all really happened in the late 1980s, and this 1988 car is an example of that change really starting to come about. Though clearly, with the bull bar on the front and tow bar on the back, this is still a proper Range Rover, with the requisite V8 to suit. As an additional note, Spen King lived through to 2010, and in his later years, he voiced his hatred for the modern SUV trend, exclaiming that he designed the Range Rover not to be a style accessory. But as the Land Rover arm of the Rover group was becoming a style icon, the Rover cars side of the group was having a bit more of an identity crisis. In 1986, the Rover 800 series was launched, becoming the first big Rover to be front-wheel drive, and it was a co-development with Honda. The Japanese company had never built a large car before, but despite this, the Rover 800 and Honda Legend only ended up sharing around 20% of their components. It was a bit of a nightmare, and Rover hadn't really learned anything in terms of quality control from their new friends. But under the skin, there was a lot of Honda-influenced componentry, not just with the front drive, but the double wishbone suspension and Honda-engineered V6. On paper, it was a bit of a come-down from the V8-engined rear-drive SD1, but in reality, the 800 was a thoroughly decent car, and I think they look fantastic. And who'd have thought this 827 Si was left rotting in a bush only a few months earlier. But there was another arm of Rover that, through the 90s, established itself as a mark all of its own. Mini. After the whole BMW saga, the Germans had taken the modern Mini as their own, but the battered and bruised MG Rover group had a few months to say goodbye to the car that kept Longbridge ticking for over 40 years, with a final run of 500 original Minis. These Cooper Sports were trimmed to infinity, a far cry from the kind of Mini you could buy even 10 years before. They had leather seats, full dashboards, spot lamps, stripes everywhere, huge arches and equally huge 13-inch alloy wheels, as well as a little plaque in the glove box, telling you it was one of the last 500 to be built to the original Sir Alec Isagonis design. Apart from the plaque, they weren't far removed from the general production MPI Minis, which was a rather major re-engineering of the A-Series engine just to keep emissions low enough and to allow classic Mini production to go on long enough to bridge the gap before the R50 could be introduced. The late model original Minis were cool, but they were very rare in period because they were aged and expensive. Lots of people actually thought they'd stopped making them years before, because in the same decade, it was a choice between a Mini or something like this, Vauxhall Nova GSI. And we all know what any rational person would have chosen in 1993. But this car being on an L and being registered in September means it's an exceptionally late Nova. By this point, the Corsa was already available, so this would have been either a great deal on the old model or bought by someone who just really loved a Nova. And Vauxhall really nailed these late Novas. The styling was there from the start, with the box arches and cheeky shape appealing much more to younger drivers than the relatively conservative Fiesta and very conservative Metro. But with that comes the body colour trim, blacked out rear panel because sporty, GSI badges everywhere and, in case you forgot, the fabulous three-spoke alloys. Bring back three-spokes, car manufacturers.
If you moved up the range, however, things did get a little more conservative, but still rather cool with this Opel Cadet GSI 16 valve. Of course, this one's European market being left-hand drive and Opel badged, but what we'd know as the Vauxhall Astra was, until 1991 or so, the Nova's big brother. And though it lacks the standout coolness of the Nova's box arches, I still think these were better looking than most of its contemporaries, like the fat Golf, the boring Escort and the awkward Maestro. These aren't style icons, but the swooping roofline of the three-door hatch makes it look like a coupe, and the vents in the C-pillar, the wing and the body kit all give it a rally car vibe. It was never the final word in hot hatches, but it's cool. But due to their provenance, Astras of this era, despite their sales figures, are relatively rare in enthusiast scenes. Due to the way the world went and the cultural influences on people of my generation, many more enthusiasts are now likely to turn their attention towards more niche models. So you see many more modified Honda Civics at shows than you ever would Mark II Astras. This car's a fourth gen Civic saloon, hailing from Honda's big growth era, when they were really taking over in the US and starting to become a real presence in Europe. But this car is just a vibe, taking a very clean Grandad spec car in all its bronzy gold glory, slamming it to the ground, fitting a splitter and split rims, is first of all the in thing, but what a mood. This one's just so cool, and only to add to that, you could tell this is a top model because at the bottom of the rear screen, it tells you it has 16 valves. Mood. But with that, thank you very much for watching. If for some reason you managed to stick with me through all five NEC show videos, then congratulations. If you enjoyed these, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.